Hey guys, what's up? It is week 125. I have a correction right off the bat. For some reason, when I was uh, talking about Hotel uh, Mobi, or Mo I always want to say Mobi, uh, Mobi, um, I uh, freaking called Jason Isaacs, Timothy Dalton. And at that moment, I could have swore that was Timothy Dalton. I don't know why. Years have passed since I've really seen it, Timothy Dalton or Jason Isaacs in anything. So when I saw him, it registered as Timothy Dalton. That is insanity. I don't know how I did it. I, but I did. So that's a correction. I also want to mention, I did watch the first uh, little, t the episode of Creep Show that came on Shudder. These are shot in a week advance, so remember that. So I'm never fresh on the new releases exactly or, you know, things like that. I could be as fresh as I can. So I watched the, just to be quick, I watched the uh, first uh, episode of Creep Show on Shudder. It was Grey Matter and Head in the House. Uh, it was really enjoyable to see. I'm not going to lie. It felt more like Tales in the Crypt than Creep Show to me, which are, they're both inspired by EC Comics style stuff. So that's perfect fine for me um and i love tales from the crypt um the first episode based on the king story gray matter from night shift it's a great story i've always enjoyed it it was cool to see it uh, brought to life i thought the practical and digital effects mix were really good um but i thought the father and son were kind of uh, i don't i don't like how they i thought they were kind of wrongly portrayed compared to how the story was and then um, there was Head in the House, which I thought was uh, really good and creepy and weird and uh, definitely worth checking out. Not enough dollhouse horror, okay? Right, guys? So let's hop right into the first review. And this first one is from Severin Films. And this is uh, the Sergio Stivaletti, want to make sure I say that right, um, this film from 1997, The Wax Mask. Yeah, this movie has had a troubled past. Um, big history and i actually covered this movie um a long time ago when they had the first one seven uh blu-ray and i'm not even sure if that was a official release or it got pulled something weird happened with it um this is a new remaster and it's loaded with features i'm actually gonna cheat for you guys if i can remember everything i don't think i'll be able to remember everything off the top of my head but here we go um these interviews on here are ridiculous my favorite is um, let me set up the movie okay the wax wax mass was supposed to be lucio falci's uh last direct it was going to direct this one and he died while they were kind of working on pre-production and the writing kind of um, part of the movie. Dario Gentier was going to produce and that's kind of a big thing because Dario and Fulci always had kind of a weird relationship and Sergio Stivaletti was going to do the special effects. He worked on stuff for Argento like Demons and a lot of the other movies so he had a, a good you know resume of effects. Dario obviously had a good resume and so did Fulci and uh, this they got all together and um, they were going to make this and Fulci passed and Stivaletti stepped up and took over which is really interesting story this movie is based kind of like on the old you know wax horror movies and like house of wax it takes place in 1900 originally and it jumps to like 1912 i believe so it takes place in paris and italy so it's got a nice little gothic kind of uh period piece thing to it interesting interesting movie and it is a shame Fulci didn't direct it but i'm not going to hold um you know the director and filmmakers accountable for something that is out of their control so um this release is really interesting uh because of all the special features like i said previously it has interviews with dario and uh, Civiletti and another of the producers and one of the actresses in the movie and the um, you know the um, composer on the film and uh, um, uh, geez Alan Jones is on here as well and there's a commentary narrated by uh, moderated by Gre David Gregory from Severin talking to Civiletti and his son so they have everything you could ever want on this release and what's crazy is they break it up into a bunch of really cool you know featurettes my favorite personally was Beyond Fulci and it's super nice to hear Dari Argento who's pretty much much considered the maestro, even though the guys like Mario Bava and Fulci are, are fan favorites and some consider them better. Um, Dario Gentu speak well of Fulci and you hear all these other guys talking about it and they paint this story that you know there's two um, halves to a truth and you hear a lot of it but it's really uh, tear jerking to be honest that the way Fulci died in his life and they just talk about it and it's just such a tragedy to be honest in a lot of ways he lived a tragic sad life and I think that's why I've always been drawn to Fulci. Besides, I've always enjoyed his movies, but getting into these features, you always hear glimpses about how angry Fulci was. and I always felt like, and then more and more, you feel like it's kind of a misunderstanding or maybe it's outlashing because his life, which is not exactly justified, but hearing these kind of things made uh, you know the story come together a little bit more, and I love seeing that. And I love, like I said, I love seeing Dario talk well of Fulci because it's always this rivalry. It's like Fulci or Argento, Fulci or Argento. And I know I'm guilty of asking that question as well, but I uh, love the special features, and I know I'm talking 
talking a lot about the features because I've already talked about this movie previously, but it is a really cool movie. Like I said, it was made in 97. It was kind of like on the dying day of the Italian horror film. You know, it was probably already dead, but we had some late stuff in the 80s with Michela Suave still directing, a lot of this stuff being produced by Dario, like this one was as well. So we have that kind of thing going on, and this is one of the last cool horror movies. We still do have some more Argentos that's pretty cool as well, a little before this of Stenhall Syndrome and, you know, Sleepless came after. But this one right here is a little special. I enjoy it quite a bit. It's very gothic, it's very weird, and it's very inspired by, you know, those old wax horror movies like House of Wax. So we have this uh, 1900, there's a murder, this little girl witnesses to it. And that's kind of like a kind of a trope they would use in Sleepless where this girl, um, Dar Daria would use in sleepless where this girl witnesses a murder her parent her mother being murdered and then comes back and or is it the son the son witnesses the murder so it has that little thing this wo this woman witnesses this murder starts and this detective knows her in paris um fast forward 12 years later she starts to work at this house of wax uh figures and uh some murders start to happen and you know what's happening and the original murder is probably the same murder and it ties into and there's a relationship between them without spoiling too much the score is really good as uh, the composer said he uh people were telling me he was inspired by Hammer, but he was like, I didn't notice. I probably was. Um, and also Bernard Herman, he he had some bits in there, he said. So it's a really nice score. Um, the movie uh, has some poor dubbing. I watched it in uh, English. I always watch my Italian and Spanish and Euro horror in English dubbed because that's the way I was raised on it and it feels the most comfortable for me to do. So I love doing that. Um, and some of it's not, not as good as the previous dubbing films from the 70s and 80s, but it, it suffices because they have obviously an international cast. Um, in here. The acting is solid for the most part. There's a decent amount of nudity and sleaze in here. Um, the gore effects are great. There's a hand getting twisted off and it's weird like the story kind of mixes in like these different, it feels like uh, you know, like the 60s stuff and even the 70s and even 80s but it also feels 90s because we have this whole changing of faces, dark man storyline we have some weird kind of Terminator style effects, um, steampunk kind of stuff going on and I'm not sure how much I repeated myself because I did review this a few years, a couple years back when uh, the original Blu-ray would came out from 17 Films. Um, uh, this is, like I said, loaded with features. I don't think that one had too many features. It's also remastered. It's a good-looking movie, and uh, they sound the sounded pretty good. Like I said, there's not much I could complain about this release. It's just kind of an underrated movie. I like these kind of weird Italian horror films from the late 80s, early 90s. This one's even in 97, so it's almost the late 90s, so it's super late in that cycle. Um, but it's uh, unique and fun and uh, inspired by stuff that I enjoy and and one of a kind because it's time and all the elements and the time and the people involved. So um, it's dedicated to Lucio Fulci and um, I think that's pretty cool. And I, I, like I said, I love the features. I love Fulci. I love Argento. I love all these people involved with the movie. So uh, quite enjoyable. Although it is, you know, it's a, it does seem a little, it drags a little bit at times here and there, but it does have a, a kind of a mean streak and the ending you're like, what what's going on? Okay, I get some of that, but some of it you're like, Oh, whatever. But uh, it's pretty cool. It's called The Wax Mask. I'm not sure that it was a good idea to work in the museum. What kind of lunatic could be responsible for this? sure that it was a good idea to work in the museum. This is the Tom Savini head. 
Nobody knows. What Fulci would have done with it, who knows? But I do like it, and I think everyone involved actually ought to be quite pleased with the way it all worked out. Okay, the next one here is uh, from Arrow Films, and this is the 1978 uh, Killer Nun movie. The Killer Nun. Nunsploitation, I guess you'd call it. I don't know if this one is technically a nunsploitation. I, I think it counts in that category, how it's The Killer Nun. But uh, this movie I did cover a while back, but the new release has a new uh, 2K master, and it has some new features. So I'm, I'm, re I'm re-diving into it to kind of let everybody know about it. Um, I'll ta start with the features. It has a commentary with a couple experts on here. That was pretty nice. They appreciate the movie and stick up for it because it's not a super beloved movie. It did end up on the video nasties list, and I'm fine with it. I don't love the movie. I think it's decent. I think the first half is pretty great and then the second half is okay but um this is actually based on a true story of a belgium um nun uh who killed some people really strange movie but we have oh geez who's the actress in here she's in a bunch of stuff i'm gonna cheat a little bit oh it's anita ekberg she's like kind of a classic actress and she stars in this so it's always fun to see kind of an actress starring in one of these kind of lose your kind of mind deals but she's this nun who has a surgery and she gets hooked on painkillers and she starts to kind of slip and lose her mind she obviously has some weird kind of uh uh, you know, past trauma with um, her mother and things like that. And there's a really bizarre scene where she says she's going to go in the city and pawn this ring for drugs because she's addicted to them now. And she says, my mother gave me this ring. And it's super weird. And she has this lesbian relationship that's kind of forced upon her by this young girl who's even more unstable than Eckberg in the movie. And, um, and she is even weirder. And she says, this is just like unintentionally hilarious, but kind of heartfelt scene where she says, I would have given you this ring. My mother, I was to give you this ring. My mother gave it to me but I'm going to pawn it for drugs and it's just such a weird bizarre movie like the first half is really sleazy and really different and it's this weird kind of idea where it feels like one flew over the cuckoo's nest and she has a, a Louise Fletcher thing for sure to me like this domineering kind of like um, cold distant kind of mean spirited quality about her and there's a scene in here that feels even too far for one flow of the cuckoo's nest. Well, because she works in this hospital. Okay. I, I just should have set up the plot. Okay. She's a nun that works in this kind of weird hospital where they take care of older patients or mentally ill patients. I'm not sure what's going on in there, but it's really weird. And it's really kind of a, a setup for a lot of horror films. Get them in a hospital, put some weird people in here and have some crazy things go on. Hell, the dead pit, uh, Hellraiser 2, tons and tons and tons of stuff like that. So we have that here to a certain extent. Eckberg is addicted to drugs and she starts to like lose her mind she starts to be very cruel and all signs point to her as the killer nun it's pretty obvious they say they say this has some giallo influences it's pretty obvious who the killer is and you're like okay where's this gonna go it has like two choices and one's not it so you know it says giallo influences but i never really felt it maybe in some of the way that deaths and murders are handled some of the deaths are really cool uh i mean some are pretty brutal especially ones with pins um joe delisandro pops up in this this was really weird when the the andy warhol guy um in a bunch of like you know flesh for Frankenstein, Blood for Dracula, Trash, Flesh, Heat, uh, the Paul Morrissey movie. So he's in this, and he had you know his Italian stint, like with stuff like The Climber, and then he's in like I don't think this one's Italian. Merry Go Round. I don't know if that one's Italian. Um, the friend, maybe it's French. But he, you know, he had a stint over in Europe as well. So he's kind of a little lackluster in this one. Um, he's usually um, you know stands out a little bit more, but he plays a really young doctor as well. Like this movie is really weird, and I'm not sure necessarily how I feel 100% about it. It's, it's sleazy as hell, and there's a couple scenes that I really like. The editing is really bizarre in here, and they point that out, and it was definitely kind of intentional and unique, and there's actually an interview with an editor or assistant editor on the movie. There's like an hour interview with the director, but the highlight of this release, of course, is the um, kind of video essay made by Kat Ellinger that goes over the whole entire genre of exploitation, where it started, starting from like black and white movies, pre-code, and then the code comes in, and they're doing all these other things, and she goes into depth about it. She talks about the devil. She talks about everything from school to holy beast, a la carta. It's very informative. It's very freaking awesome. And it's worth the price of a mission if you're into killer uh, nuns movie or nun exploitation movies. This was my favorite part of the release. I enjoy the movie to a certain extent, uh, you know, but uh, there's some unintentional funny stuff in which I dig, but there's some really cool psychological stuff. But I think the movie kind of loses its steam at the very end. And the end of this movie, um, it... it the end gets some points too because you don't see typical movies end like this. You're like, that's it? 
That's how they're going to end this. That's what they're doing here. And uh, I like that. Um, so it's kind of a darker than expected. But like I'd say the third act kind of loses steam until the very ending. So, But the first part, the setup and stuff, I love that. Especially um, involving a scene with dentures. And it's just like, oh my god. It's just so mean. But also... Um, <laughs> This, that's the type of thing where someone will laugh and just like uncontrollably laugh, but also feel disgusted and that, that part in there. But I think it looks pretty good. I know the old Blue Underground DVD, a uh, Blu-ray is still out there, so I'm sure this is an improvement of it. I'm, I don't remember having much complaints about that one too, but if you're a diehard fan, then it's probably worth the upgrade for sure. Kill or none. May his soul burn in hell. Just the thought of what he did to me makes me want to take revenge on all men. To snuff them out like he snuffed out no. my happiness. No, sister. That's enough. <laughs> oh, Matilda, silly, that's who you are. You've been rolling your eyes at me ever since you were transferred here. <laughs> You will help me, won't you, Doctor? I promise I'll make you very happy. to suffer. Life has always been difficult. I'm sorry, Mother. What did you say? <laughs> Nothing. I agree, Sister Mathieu. I swear on this cross I'm innocent. <sighs> Please take Sister Gertrude to her cell. Give her a sedative, Sister Louise. I think Sister Gertrude could freak out any second. Why did you kill Jeannot, Sister? <sighs> Don't you have any faith in Mm -mm. No. You're wrong to be so pessimistic. The police solve crimes. It's their job. The police look out for their own interest. This is to the scalpel. <sighs> what's wrong with you this morning? You know what's wrong, Doctor. She discovered certain discrepancies in the drug register. My, my son was responsible. He was addicted to it. It was morphine. Of course, I should have reported it. Okay, we have one from Dark Side Releasing, and this is Lonely Hearts. Oh boy, man. Um, this is going to be hard to talk about. This is a really weird movie. This is an English horror movie, you know, uh, from the UK. Just in English, yeah, yeah, I'm double thing there, overkill. But um, okay, so this is really weird. This is by a pair of directors, uh, and I, I don't think I've ever seen anything by them. So this is uh, kind of a reality show deal. Think Columbus, um, you know, how they have the reality show set up. More like, you know, the, the Big Brother kind of deal. So they have like a reality show where they're have doing these lonely hearts where they're going to try to match people up and have a dating show. Right away, the people behind the scenes doing the show don't seem right. They seem seedy. Something's kind of going on. But And it's called Lonely Hearts. You know, it's a kind of erotic horror film. So you know something's going on. Really, about an hour of this film passes before anything violent happens in the movie. There is underlining things in here, but nothing really happens till the hour mark. So we have two couples, well, you know, five people in there, three young people, a young guy, two young women, and an older couple, one who is a priest. So 
they have these in there and they kind of set up the young people and over time two of the young people become really despicable and you start to despise them and you start to kind of get attached to the older people and feel sorry for them a little bit in this kind of way the movie is um you know has a couple different cameras they use it seems like and they have like cameras in place so like they're being spied on and stuff like that and they encourage them to have sex and there are some really graphic sex scenes in here i had the double look a little closer yeah i was looking close yeah i'm not trying to be pervert like Ugh. but i had to look a little closer to be like are they really having sex or is this simulated and basically it looks like what they're doing is just stripping down naked and you know not going penetration but they're just rubbing it i was like that is not safe so i guess they were pretty comfortable with it so there is some full frontal male nudity in here of an erect penis which kind of surprised me because you don't normally see that I, I doubt it was prosthetic but you know you never know but uh yeah so there's that going on but like i said you start to learn a little bit about these characters and you start to really kind of despise a couple of them and you start to like a few of them even though there were some dark things in their past and they start to bring all that up but it does take a long time to get there and it's not particularly shot well it's shot like a reality a cheap cheap reality tv show and then when the big reveal kind of ending happens you're thinking what was the point of this to make it look like this was it to trick them or are they selling this as an entire package without spoiling too much but what they did do in this movie was create some characters i genuinely cared about and when they were killed i actually was at that point where i was like what is the point of this this is so mean-spirited and disgusting that I don't understand why this is made. And is that why it's made? To make me sick or to feel bad? Because I genuinely felt bad for a couple of these people, which shows effectiveness in the movie, but also at the same time kind of confused me. And I was just like, I don't, it's just like, I don't know why I watched it, like all that. And that's, I guess, is horror to a certain extent. So some people may get, you know, uh, fundamentally get something out of that. I'm not sure if I did or not. That's why I'm kind of coming in like, I don't really know what to say about it positively or negatively, but except that there's some brutal things in here and it is a long ride to get to them. But there's a couple funny moments as well, almost in the audacious kind of way that you have reveals of the characters uh, when they're asking them questions and they have to answer things like two truths and a false or something like that or two falses and a truth. And they're like, and they're like what? What? And you're just like, yeah. So they got some cool things going for them. The setup, I kind of enjoy the fake reality show way to get horror in their deal uh, at times. I think it works. I mean, I love Colobus, so I'm a big sucker for that. Lonely Hearts, I'm a little iffy on. I'm not sure. Like I said, it's pretty mean-spirited and I don't mind mean-spirited spirited but i feel like there should be kind of a point or something a little bit deeper in there and, and there is to a set extent but i'm not sure this one 100 percent works for me it's not awful but there's a lot of features on here there's a commentary there's a bunch of interviews and uh there's some short films as well that is lonely hearts um this company also released a movie i really like called the black forest by um, a brazilian filmmaker i'd recommend hunting that one down because that is really a great movie and i haven't heard many people talk about it
okay, what would a week be complete without an Andy Sedaris movie? I don't think it would now. It's Do or Die. Yeah, this one was made in 91. This is the last of the ones that Mill Creek released. So uh, no Andy Sedaris for a while after this. But Do or Die, yes, it's got Pat Morata in it. Or what is his name? Morata? Morita? Morita, there we go. He's in, um, what is that really stupid movie with the, um, the cannibals and Michael Berryman? Uh, Auntie Lee's uh, <laughs> Meat Pies or something like that? He's in that. Of course, he's in The Karate Kid. And this one also has Eric Estrada. And it's got, um, who is who is the woman in here? Uh, Spear, she's in here again. So it's pretty much similar. Um, some bad guys want to, uh, uh, basically, she uh, these two uh, kind of pe- women from the agency again. Um, I hope Marie Carlton hasn't been in the last couple. They've upset this big time kind of drug boss, gun dealer, whatever the hell Pat Morita kind of crime syndicate he's involved with. They upset him. So basically, he's going to send six groups of assassins, six pairs of assassins after you. And the game of death plays all across the globe. Of course, they get some of their buddies to help them, including Eric Estrada, who's now a good guy in this one. Yeah, switching teams. But he different character. So basically, they go around the country, and um, they are attacked. They're in beautiful locations, fun locations, Louisiana, you know, wonderful islands. So we got six teams after them, and eventually they kind of go back to, um, you know, the very ending, and it kind of, I, I, you know, I don't want to spoil too much what happens to Pat Morita, but we have that thing going on. Occasionally, there is some nudity, of course, and there's these weird massage scenes with Pat Morita getting massages and giving massages, and I'm just wondering, like, is he married? Like, is his wife... I, this is the kind of movie that where his wife is like, I don't want you doing no more Andy Sedaris movies. He's getting massages by this, uh, you know, you know, bare chested woman and giving her massages, talking about the special way acupuncture and stuff like that. And you're just like, okay. But, um, yeah, the, the teams are, are different kind of styles and everything like that. Um, some they get blown up, they get shot, they get arrested. It's really silly. It's enjoyable to be honest. At certain points, they try to incorporate as much vehicle chasing in here, planes chasing cars, uh, motorcycles for some reason, um, exploding baseballs. Don't ask me. I'm just talking about the movie. It's ridiculous. Like all the other Andy Sedaris movies, it's a little bit more enjoyable than the last couple. I thought this one was fun. It ends in that same embarrassing group of people talking like, didn't we do great? Yeah. Boom. Might as well give each other a high five. It ends like on the episode of like a a 70s TV show would. They always do. They're always cheesy. There's a woman in here who has the biggest breast implants ever. She doesn't do much acting, but she walks around with giant breast implants. And I'm thinking... I was worried about her back. I was like, oh, those are really big implants. And she's like walking. I was like, that's got to hurt. I can only imagine, you know. Uh, it's like the elephant, man. When sometimes when something, your head's so big, it just cut off his air. I'm just wondering, like, it's crippling her back. Um, but there were, there were giant breasts. And I, that's probably the reason Andy Sedaris put her in the movie. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm a regular Sherlock Holmes, right, guys? But, uh, yeah, it's silly. It's goofy. It's uh, remastered and looks great, but it's typical Andy Sedaris. I'm ready to continue this journey if more of these are going to come out. So, yeah. Do or die. A new kind of game. I have hired six teams of assassins. You are their quarry. And Marita stars as Kane, an international crime lord with a score to settle. You are dead. Nothing to it. Right. Starring Eric Estrada, Donna Spear, Roberta Vasquez, Bruce Penhall, and Pat Morita as Kane. We get hazardous duty pay for this. I hope we live long enough to spend it. Do or die. Get the job done. Okay, guys, we're going to hop into the vinegar syndrome stuff. Uh, I, I was going to show these an update, but I decided to watch all of them and review all of them for you. The vineyard. The vineyard. I always call it the fucking vineyard as a kid, and it's stuck in my head. The vineyard. It's a vineyard, Dave. It's a vineyard. Get it right. But yeah, I seen part of this movie years ago, and I never finished it. I don't know why, but yeah, here we go. The vineyard. Uh, starring James Hong, uh, directed by James Hong. He's in everything. He's in Big Trouble in Little China. He's in China Girl. The guy has like 500 credits to him. Okay, this is uh, made in the late 80s. This is a bonkers kitchen sink kind of horror movie. Um, It's shot amazingly well. Vinegar Syndrome remastered this thing to look top notch. I am surprised uh, how well they did this. Um, I was like, geez, it looks beautiful. 
This movie is nonsense. Um, James Hong is this kind of weird alchemist who deals with wines and, you know, trying to find eternal life. He has a really over-the-top but fun performance. Okay, he has, uh, you know, these guards that guard his vineyard in a private island. So he brings out young people to kind of drain their life and, you know, try to live forever because he needs that for his elixir of life. Meanwhile, at the same time, we have these zombies who I believe were maybe possible victims of his that have this weird curse and there's magic going around and they rise from the dead if they don't have sacred dirt put on them. So we have that going on. And so basically we have James Hong kind of turning back and forth into this kind of old creepy man. And it's hilarious when he does it because he freaks out and he's like, give me that one, give me that serum, give me that serum. And it's just over the top nonsense. Um, there's quite a bit of sleaze in here. And uh, I think James Hong regretted that in the special features. So he said, Maybe it would have been a little bit more approachable if there wasn't so much sleaze in it, but it was of the time. So this movie's really entertaining. It's really ridiculous. They managed to squeeze in some kung fu. Um, there's some decent effects, some blood effects, some gore effects, uh, enough sex and nudity to keep you interested. The acting's not particularly great, but the movie is always entertaining, a little bit silly and funny. And I would put it on the caliber of something like The Spookies, where you're just like, what is going on? How did this get made? Why is there all this weird stuff happening? I thought the zombies looked tremendous. I'm a sucker for zombies um weird black magic weird stuff when you have magic and alchemy you can like get away with nonsense all the time and this movie does it there's an interview with james hong and the producer on here as slash actor um it is his directorial debut and it's like i was joking i was like it's just like his midlife crisis he's like i'm gonna put myself in a movie with a bunch of naked women and direct it and just be the star in it but you know it is hard for a lot of character actors to get a starring role and you know they do a great job and they deserve it so yeah hell sometimes you have to direct it yourself look at uh billy bob thornton's sling blade so um, so it's really uh, kind of you know his like uh, swan song I guess in a lot of ways and then we have co the interview with the co-director on here and he talks about it and everything working with everybody and they seem to no real bad blood between anybody on here and then we have an interview with the cinematographer and he talks about you know making uh, the best he could do on a small budget and the cinematography looks great for this movie way better than this movie should look I think this one's worth picking up I think it's really funny really goofy there was an old Anchor Bay DVD that I used to have it's just weird and it's nice to see James Hong star in this one and uh, go back and forth with all these weird special effects. It's just nonsense. I like it. Something beyond horror is happening here. Within this island. Inside this mansion. And underneath this earth. A secret that lies buried in the vineyard. This is a passageway to unholy evil. An evil ruled by one man. A man without a soul. Show me away, Lord! Who survives on the souls of others. They must die so that he may live. Far from the civilized world, seven innocent visitors have journeyed to this isolated land of beauty, luxury, and mystery. How do you do, Dr. Poe? Oh? May I introduce you to this most charming young lady? Let the party be! <laughs> Dr. Poe, you're a truly fine winemaker. Almost obsessed. <laughs> he flatters me. I'm not that successful. In fact, I'm still looking for that, that balance. That... Perfect ingredient. Dr. Poe, are they not a healthy looking group of young people? Yes, they are. They are no longer guests. They are prisoners and the next victims of the darkest powers in creation. Help me. To new discoveries. I feel like I'm looking into the past. You are looking into the past. But it can be your future also if you want it to be. <gasps> 
got a strong feeling about this, Jezebel. I know you do, too. Yes, I do. Dr. Crow is a special man, Jeremy, and he's good to me. And that's something that you don't see, or you don't want to. When every desire, every impulse, and every pleasure is indulged and fulfilled, do you wish to give yourself to eternity? Yes, Dr. Poe. The powers of the forbidden are unlocked, and the undead are unleashed. is a place where your deepest fears come alive. The vineyard. Okay, the next vinegar syndrome is Pledge Night. Yeah, a slasher from 1990. Acid Sid. Now this one I had seen actually a couple times. I always remember that cover. I always like this always remind me of Ghoulies 3 because it's like college and like the toilet and everything like that. Oh, Pledge Night. You know, 1990, these guys are thinking slashers are big. The filmmakers, they're like, we got to do this. Let's get a piece of this pie, right? Okay, so Freddy Krueger, 1990, he's big, so we need a slasher that's goofy, a supernatural slasher. You know, somebody has these powers. Pledge Night. This movie is nonsense. Okay, like I said, we have a group of pledges taking place during a Pledge Week or Hell Week, and uh, we have these ridiculous people putting them through hell. Of course, back in the day, years ago, somebody was killed uh, during Hell Week. This guy named Acid Sid, played by uh, somebody from Anthrax, which is crazy. Um, he gets put into an acid bath. They forgot there's acid. He melts. So uh, what happens is he comes back during Pledge Week to kind of, and he inhabits somebody's body, and they originally think this guy's going crazy. They think it's a prank, but it's not. It's really Acid Sid, and he comes out and he starts killing and slashing everybody. Um, the kills are over the top. They're ridiculous in here. It's a typical kind of college thing in a lot of ways. The movie's clearly low budget um it, it's not great to be honest but i have kind of a, a love for this one and i've always kind of enjoyed it because it's so goofy and weird and just a zany off-brand slasher movie that i'm surprised ever got uh, it never got a dvd and it's just getting a blu-ray i'm just like i am so happy that vinegar syndrome did this one because it's one that's always been stuck in my head um the characters are pretty dumb for the most part the college kids they're annoying um they're kind of stereotypes to a certain extent some of them they tend to kill them off from most likable to least likable which is always kind of crazy to do um, the guy who plays um, one of the guys who's initially possessed and he's supposed to play the bad man where he acts crazy amongst everybody to scare the pledges, but he actually gets possessed. He's actually really good on this and really fun as well. Some of the, the acting ranges, some are good, some are fine, some are decent. The kills also range. I know this movie was butchered um, to deaths, which really sucks, but it was. So a lot of them are cut out, but some of them are fun. And it's just one of these kind of deals where like the first half is a comedic kind of college humor movie, but it's on a budget. You know, not as quite on the level of Revenge of Nerds quality, not even close, but maybe like not as goofy as Ghoulies 3 kind of kind of humor like that. But we have these pledges being forced to do really gross things like picking up cherries with their butts and sitting on like ice blocks and picking the cherries. It's just like, I would never do this in college. I'm, like, I'm not doing that. I'm not being in your fraternity, you know? I mean, I, I went to a community college because I'm a smart man. No, I'm, I'm a dummy. But uh, I'm not saying everybody that went to community college is a dummy, but I most certainly am. But uh, yeah, so <laughs> we have uh, Pledge Night. And like, this is this the ridiculous stuff they make them do to join a fraternity? Is like, is this real? Like, why is this happening? Like, I would never, it's, it's so far-fetched. It's almost more far-fetched than the murders, even though I'm pretty sure these fraternity things do happen, which is nonsense. But they do. Um, there's some interviews on here. Uh, I think 
think we have one with the uh geez, we have one with the producer or no it was is it the producer or the director i can't think um she worked in porno films and she talks about doing her research and talking about the real kind of stuff that would happen i'm gonna double check yeah we do have one with the director as well and the the um the producer writer that's the one i wanted to be kind of concerned about because she talks more and more about like how the fraternities really did this kind of stuff and and everything like that and the filmmakers also talk about somebody quitting because they didn't want to do one of the homophobic things in here dogpiling each other jumping on each other in a dog pile and uh there's also an interview with uh, the lead actor in here a couple of the actors one uh plays one of the pledges and one who plays the bad man the guy who does the bad man is it seems a very like energetic character loves to talk and and he seems to have you know w- should have had a bigger career i think you know as a like theater actor but he's just kind of animated and he does a very good entertaining interview so um uh, and then the other guy remembers a lot of the things they put them through with the bugs on his face and everything like that so it's a nice release it looks pretty good this is a very low budget movie um I don't know if I can give it a recommend. I would give it a recommend because it's goofy and weird and I like slasher movies. And if you're into those like late 80s, early 90s slasher films that are definitely inspired by kind of like Freddy Krueger, um, the killer's motives are absolutely nonsensical. It has a decent body count, has some nudity. There's a really mean-spirited scene where they have a cow party or something like pig party. Um, so it reminds me of that scene in Revenge of the Nerds where have some, have some more pig or have some more pigs for your party nerds, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I think people will get some entertainment value out of this. Um, it's not, um, it, it also reminds me a little bit of that one Syn- Synapse put out like years back called Frat, uh, Frat Massacre or something, Frat House Massacre, uh, although that one is much more homophobic, I mean, not homophobic, uh, homoerotic than this one, even though there was a little bit, um, inherently about, you know, fraternities that are kind of homoerotic at the same time, especially in the movies. So yeah, but this one, um, fairly, uh, entertaining slasher movie, really goofy. Each year, this wild fraternity pledges six new members. This year, there is one difference. Beyond these doors, within these walls, for these college students, Pledge Night is about to begin. Pledge Night, Brothers to the End, The Very End. Okay, this next one uh, kind of surprised me. This was originally distributed by Troma. This is Beyond Evil. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this one, I saw years, part of it years ago, 1980. It is directed by a guy named Herb Free, who was originally a rabbi. So that's kind of interesting. There's actually an interview with him and the producer on here. And the producer talks about wanting to get in, make some money off horror movies. And uh, the director talks about, you know, originally being a rabbi, wanting to be a filmmaker. That stuff's interesting. Um, This movie, Beyond Evil, is super generic. It was shot in the Philippines. It's a very generic plot, very generic story about a, a couple moving into a weird house and the woman being possessed by an ancient evil that's in the house of a woman who is kind of, you know, hurt by her husband. Husband. you know it reminds me of stuff like what is it um, mausoleum not as crazy and off 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 you know it's rocker as mausoleum or something like um scared stiff where we have one of the husband or wife being possessed by an ancient evil in the house um the saving grace of this movie is a couple things uh first off it stars john saxton who is one of my favorite actors i'm gonna be honest i love john saxton when i think about it i'm always like cannibal apocalypse a nightmare on elm street almost everything he pops up in i am just happy that he's there he is a uh, war hunt he's very straight at playing even in the most ridiculous things no matter how stupid it is he seems legit seems like a very you know you know intelligent guy who's just going to be very straightforward and not believe in anything nonsensical and take it as straight as he can um one of my favorite performances in cannibal apocalypse ever i love that performance but um he's really good in this and his wife in this is linda day george which is really crazy to me is like was christopher george originally going to be in this because they were always in movies together but you know and uh the director would go later work with linda day george and christopher george later on in graduation day so it's like oh i wonder if there was talks of having christopher george in this um so yeah Okay, so um, Beyond Evil, like I said, they're the saving grace. They give really good performances in here. The kills are a little lackluster, pretty typical possession, eye beam kind of things, people jumping out windows. There's a really funny doll in here that 
really cracked me up, to be honest. Like, there's this satanic doll thing that's sitting there. Because the house was possessed by this Alma lady who um, was betrayed by her husband, and she was into black magic, so they both died in there, tragic deaths, and she's getting possessed by her. So she's, like, fighting it all the time. Another interesting aspect of this movie is the person who invites them come down to this area is um, this kind of like, you know, businessman, kind of sleazy guy, but he's John Saxon's best friend and John Saxon's an engineer. So he invites him to, you know, basically run this uh, building of this, uh, you know, run this whole kind of look over building this, you know, place and get it together because he's really good at his job. But he had a relationship with John Saxon's wife previously. So there's a weird kind of love triangle thing going on here. And you think immediately that Del Giorgio, that's his name, is just going to be a sleazeball piece of crap. But they give him a couple moments of genuine character where I was like, he is a little shady. But when they give him these moments, I was like, he's a real character. And I actually kind of like that a little bit more than I thought it would. Um, the characters are a little deeper than you think they would be for something like this. So I, I thought this one came above average because of those little things, because otherwise on paper, it's very generic, very, you know, trying to get the, the you know, the spiritual kind of, re the, the, I guess the mm, religious figure of the area to come out and pull demons out of her kind of deal. There is one gnarly kind of head explosion in here in a flashback that kind of cuts really soon and it looks really good, but that's kind of strange. Besides that, the deaths are kind of like lackluster. The performances from the two leads or even three are really good, especially Saxton. So I do think it's worth checking out. It looks really good. I remember this movie compared to how it used to. It was really dark and kind of couldn't see what anything was going on, so I turned it off. But um, there's a couple parts where I laughed out loud hysterically, not because they're bad, but just because they were so awesome. Um, John Saxon goes to a hospital and one of the characters is involved with the businesses is also shady. He's a doctor and he took some x-rays, not x-rays, some lab stuff for his wife because there's something wrong with her. And, um, he goes to the hospital and he starts arguing with all these people because they don't have the results. He's like, I was just here. And, uh, Saxon's been mild mannered, very straightforward and firm, but very kind of, um, you know, you know, not aggressive guy in this whole movie and violent. And, um, at one point an orderly grabs him and like in a flash, boom, hits him in the stomach. It looks real. And it just was so quick. And then they show him walking out all angry. And I was like, that was awesome. And you see the orderly in the back, like, Oh, holding his stomach. I was like, yes, get him Saxton. But, um, good movie. Uh, not horrible. Like I expect, I honestly expected this to be the, my least favorite of the four, uh, September releases from vinegar syndrome, but I enjoyed it beyond evil. Beyond Evil is a terrifying journey beyond life. The mute beyond death. Beyond evil. You need that house like a hole in the head. It's a little goodwill. For more than two centuries, the evil within Casa Fortuna lay dormant. What he means is the place is supposed to be haunted. It's all a legend. Everyone on the island knows. Alma Martin lives. <laughs> Changing, don't you realize? What strange force possessed the husband, John Saxon? I can't fight anymore. The wife, Linda Day George. I want my wife back. I don't care what it takes. The lover, Michael Dante. Leave that place now, before it's too late. As long as your wife remains within her reach, she's in danger of contamination, possession. <gasps> Scare the hell out of you. 
Okay, this next one is Secta Sinistra. I'm just going to call it the Bloody Sec because I'm a moron, like I said. So yeah, this one was made in 1982 by a Spanish director. This is a Spanish film. He didn't do any other horror movies. Um, you learn this because Cat Ellinger does the commentary. Love the commentary on this movie. Okay, this one's 1982. Uh, this is again about a woman being kind of possessed. Rosemary's Baby, the Omen type ripoff thing. This one has a lot of horror influences in it. We have this uh, husband who he's just a really kind of weird guy where he uh, had a woman that he got in a car accident with and she had brain damage, so she's crazy, and they force her to live up in the attic while he sleeps with his hot new girlfriend. So uh, one day when he's cheating on his kind of wife that he got in a car accident with, it's really weird and complicated, um, she comes down and gouges out his eyes. She goes to a mental uh, facility. Uh, the mental facility basically is just a jail where they throw her and for years in the same clothes and she just kind of goes around and be in, insane in the cell with no change of clothes or anything like that. No health care. No, no, nobody taking care of her. And uh, the, the blind man now marries, remarries, and he wants to have a kid. He can't have a kid, so they get um, uh, inseminated. And what happens is there's this evil cult that inseminates her with a devil sperm. So basically she is carrying Satan's child or the Antichrist. So basically we get the kind of omen, Rosemary's Baby ripoff storyline. We have this blind man who's stuck in this weird kind of area with uh, this his possessed girlfriend. And then on top of that, it gets worse because they send a helper to help her uh, out who's this crazy woman who's super aggressive and super mean to watch and make sure nothing happens to the pregnant woman and, you know, Satan's baby. And besides that, we have some people who are kind of uncovering it. And we also see the sect going around or the cult going around and killing people who got babies aborted, who interfered with their actions. And that's pretty much the plot of the movie. Did I mention that the blind guy's sister's hanging around too and they have an annoying kid? So that's all in here. This movie is uh, pretty crazy. My favorite part of the movie is all the crazy women. We have one that's crazy from possession, one that's crazy from physical damage, and one that's crazy because she has a weird religious belief and stuff like that. So we have these like, it's like those, uh, this women in hysterics just going nuts and all different reasons for being crazy. And we have this guy who is completely useless in the movie. He, it's kind of, He's he does he can't he's blind he can't defend himself he can't really do anything he can't see he can't give a, a woman a child so he's really kind of inept um, in a lot of ways in the movie. There's one thing about this movie that I have to address um, that really kind of bothered me and normally it doesn't get to me. I know I don't like animal cruelty in movies. I'm not you know I love Cannibal Holocaust because I think it's a great film. I don't enjoy the animal cruelty. And I know a lot of people are saying, how can you judge this movie on that and not that one? But I, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. Um, the Bloody Sec has the worst special effects I've ever seen in a movie that, um, you know, looks like it has any money behind it. Now I'm talking movies that I would make. The effects are like that caliber. And it kind of surprises me. There's really horrible bats in here. And they would be funny. And I wouldn't care there are bad effects. And there's a really, really terrible devil baby that is, that is literally just a plastic doll. And they don't hide it at all. But having those terrible effects like that, the blood's not great, whatever, whatever, it doesn't matter. But they decide to kill a toad for real, probably to save money and be lazy. And it's just like that scene with the toad killing, it's like your effects already look like crap. You're not going for realism. You have not really a good job on any of the effects before. So why do you got to do this? Are you trying to save money? Are you just being lazy? Are you just like, eh? regardless, it felt really out of place even in this movie, even though it was a product of its time. And it really kind of disgusted me how it was done and everything like that. Um, saying that, I did enjoy the lead, uh, the, the performance from the crazy women in the movie. And everybody does a decent job. It is really a bonkers kind of batshit movie where you're just like, this is so stupid and so ridiculous and I wish the toad wasn't in there because I think I would appreciate it a little bit more and I can't believe I'm doing this because I never do this I'm always like I'm always like a defender of cannibal holocaust even though I hate the animal violence in the movie this one I'm like against because of it and it's just maybe because the movie doesn't merit it's not good enough anywhere to merit that for me and I know that's not a good reason enough for anything like that because all that's sub, you know subjective and it's just really lousy of me to feel that way but I feel that way uh, like I said Ken Ellinger does some decent uh, commentary work on here like she always does she always does a good job and she talks a lot about 
you know, the director's kind of other work and how this movie fared and how it was kind of lost in obscurity and stuff like that. Cause I never heard of this movie in my life, to be honest. I didn't recognize anybody in the movie. Um, and, and for that, I've seen way worse movies that get more recognition, but it is interesting. They cleaned it up. It did a decent job with it. It only is in Spanish with English subtitles, no dub. Um, but yeah, it, it has some, you know, it's a lot like other horror movies, but it has some decent weird things going on that I think people will appreciate. It is, uh, the bloody sec. Okay, next we have a Patreon pick from Matt Brown, and this one was made, what, 2010, and this is I Saw the Devil. Yeah, finally watched this one. I never saw it. I had it for years. It's like two hours and 22 minute serial killer South Korean epic movie, so saying that, uh, I put this in, and the first 20 to 30 minutes, I was captivated completely. The plot of this movie, slight spoilers, we have this uh, kind of special agent or just police officer who has a fiance who is murdered by a serial killer. His fiance's father is uh, kind of a police chief, semi-retired police chief. So they, they're close and this guy loses his mind and decides he's going to find out who the serial killer is and, you know, hurt him bad no matter at what cost. Um, the first like 20, 30 minutes of this movie are really heartfelt and touching because we have this interaction between the police chief and the uh, fiance, you know, the, the fiance of his daughter. And um, the old man, like this old kind of tough, you know, cop, he has like a breakdown on the bench and he like starts to cry and it's just uncomfortable, really sad and touching all at the same time. And I was like, that was immense and powerful filmmaking there. Seeing like kind of an older, you know, person like that, his breakdown and cry was just kind of upsetting. Um, the way that they find the uh, her body is also really upsetting, and the way they shoot it with the inner with all the police around and the paparazzi, not the paparazzi, the reporters and stuff like that, it's really powerful stuff and really well made. Um, the performances in this movie are tremendous, especially from the serial killer. He plays. I, I would put it on something like a level of like you know when you play like those crazy like kind of intense performances as like a Katana or an Anthony Wong, more like an Anthony Wong when we're coming to like these kind of uh, uh, Asian serial killer movies or Asian like you know psychologically damaged characters he reminds me of, like an Anthony Wong in a lot of ways from like um, Untold Story or um, Ebola Syndrome and I thought his performance was tremendous and I think Anthony Wong's are great as well but I was just like wow he's so intense and so crazy and just such a, a, a psychopath he does not care but um, basically this detective ruins his life tracks him down beats him puts a tracking device in there doesn't kill him just hurts him at every step of the way and keeps tracking him down and beating him and beating him and beating him and there's a lot of dark humor in that especially the way that the serial killer reacts to the beatings he's like oh and just like that but i mean it's how he would react but it's just funny watching this piece of crap get get beat up but of course like any great revenge movie you don't get your cake and you get to eat it too you know what i mean because obviously this serial killer is very dangerous and he has friends and there's going to be a time when he comes up on top and this cop is going to have to pay for what he's done or people around him are going to have to pay for what he's done i think that the first half of this movie is wonderful the second half is great when we get to meet some of the serial killer's connections including this cannibal and his his um significant other i guess i'd call her i don't really know she doesn't say much yeah but uh the cannibal is really crazy really weird performance by him as well um there's this really intense scene where the serial killer and the cannibal are staring at each other and the cannibal starts to cry and he's like, and then he breaks his character and he's like i hate it i cry when i get tense or intense or something like that and i was just like Wow. Great performance again by him. Um, there's great fighting in here as well. I thought the fighting was really well done. I think the last part of this movie, I think it loses a little scene for me because uh, with uh, you know the killer getting the upper hand, there's some part of it that doesn't work as well. I think it's really um, uh, done too quickly. 
like I think that um, there's no sitting in it or, or dwelling in it deeper. It needs to go a little deeper into it. I thought I thought that some of it could have been explored a little bit more, and I was a little let down. But I still think it was a great movie. I think it was well acted, well shot, looked amazing. The special effects were top notch. It was really brutal, and it's not something where I was like, oh yes, I love watching these poor people be murdered. Uh, really brutal. I did enjoy watching him get the crap beat out of him a lot. That was very fun. But his uh, he's really scary and just intense complete psychopath and there's some funny moments in here like i said it is a darkly comedic thing where he's ready to pull over the next person and kill him in a car and an army convoy comes through and stuff like that and he's like just standing there like so it's some cool stuff i would highly recommend it i, I should have seen it years ago but i saw the devil cool stuff thanks matt brown for the patreon pick What's up, guys? What what week is this? Week 21? Week 22? Yeah. Somewhere around there. We got way too much headroom on that center camera. But I'm going to leave it because we're in a rush. But this is uh, Hammer Time. We're doing, uh, what is it, 1966 Plague of the Zombies. And what we learned was, um, in the like special features on this one, this one was like shot back-to-back -back with... There's four movies, and two were shot back-to-back -back using the same sets. It was uh, Plague of Zombies, Dracula, Prince of Darkness, The Reptile, and Rasputin the Mad Monk. Next week is Rasputin the Mad Monk. John Gilling did this and The Reptile, I think, using the same set. So, Plague of the Zombies, 1966. Did this have anybody we were too familiar with? It had, not too familiar. Michael but Ripper, of course. It had Michael Ripper. It had the it had Watson from Hounds. Of oh Basketball. yeah, Andre uh, Morel, who is also in Shadow of the Cat, is the old man. He was really good in that. He was yeah. a mean son of a bitch in that movie. Yeah, it's got a, it's got a decent cast, but all these Hammer movies usually do. So the plot of this one is, uh, if you you know, it's a plot of like the Sherlock Holmes movie, 
and then a Dracula movie. Um, a doctor, uh, and Andre Morel, gets a letter from his colleague that says there's something very strange happening on this island, which is also the setup to Zombie, really. Um, mm-hmm. The daughter gets the strange letters from Richard Johnson. She goes to look for him. So this doctor shows up and realizes something very strange is happening on the island. We have this weird superstitious village. It's kind of like the Gorgon again where people are disappearing, and, of course, there's zombies going around. And it sets up what's going to happen, and you don't even register. You know what I mean? It sets up all the tropes and everything like that. Do you want to get into this? Um, like, it, it was an okay movie. It's it's really slow. Yeah, and, and that's funny, because we started watching this, and I remember, um, I was like, people said the Gorgon was slow, and you're, you're crazy, that movie's great, and I was like, they said this one was slow, too, I think, um, on a podcast, and I was like, so maybe I'll like this one, too. Maybe I'm just the opposite, and I put this in. And you almost fell asleep within the first 45 minutes. You're yeah. like, I gotta get up and walk around for a second. Yeah. And then at the last, like, half an hour, I was like, I started going out. I was like, wait, wait, what happened? So, it is a slow movie. And, uh, you know, that's, it's a bad time, like, 6 o'clock in the evening to watch a movie. Mm-hmm. So, you start to, if you're a little tired, you might doze off. It is a slower film. Uh, it's it's well made. It's got nice sets. It's got a decent cast, like I said. Michael Rupert, this is probably my favorite part he got to play, besides, like, didn't he play one of the coachmen that was a tiny role? The biggest role yeah. he had was, like, so far as a sergeant. In this one, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, he, he's really good in this one. Um, it's cool to see a policeman where a town's every, or, like, in a town where everybody's all paranoid and, like, they don't like outsiders, and he see the policeman, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to believe you guys. Let's see. Yeah, what I mean, got. like, they, yeah. uh, what happens is, like, Andre Morel comes here, and there's a, a rich, kind of weird, like, uh, owner. Uh, he, like, owns everything. He disappeared for a while and came back. He was uh, clearly studying voodoo. Yeah. And uh, he has these this band of assholes who look like they're right from the Hound of Baskersville opening. Mm-hmm. Like, the rapist guy. Like, they're just creeps. Has a group of assholes that work for him. And people keep dying and then disappearing, and then they'll come back as kind of like zombies throughout the town. And uh, you know what's going on right away. There's no secret to any of it. Yeah, there's no secret. Um, the, the villain was okay. I don't, he was solid. He was yeah. okay. Um, he, but he doesn't... So his motivation is to have these zombies work in his tin mine. Yeah, to make money. But he doesn't seem like the greedy type. He seems more like the bad scientist type. Yeah, like... I guess, you know, you're watching it, and, like, you know right away that he's the guy turning your brain into zombies. Maybe oh, yeah, there's no, there's no secret. It. But you forget, they do have the tin mine, and they say that his family owned it. And you completely forget about that. Yeah. And with the ideas of the voodoo zombies, you know that voodoo, Haitian zombie kind of thing, was all about making people your slaves and making them do manual labor. So right. it's, like, pretty obvious, but I didn't catch on because maybe I was just dozing off. Wait, I don't think it was ever explicitly stated. It was just, like... They said it. He was like, he was like, oh, here's the tin mine over here. Be careful, like, okay. And then like, they were like, nobody works here anymore. And then the at Andre the end of the like, movie, oh, probably because it's haunted. Yeah, he caught on it, it was a Scooby Doo plot. Let's be honest, it really was a Scooby Doo plot. And like um, you said, the zombie in the opening of Scooby Doo looks a lot like the Plague yeah, Zombie. Zombie, so. very, very similar. Um, um, there is a weird nightmare sequence that feels straight super gothic and super like Euro. I was going like, to say that's that my favorite a scene. That's a really cool scene. And there is a Grandpa Zombie. I call him Grandpa Zombie. There's a Grandpa Zombie, and he's like behind him, like yeah, like cheesing it up, like. And the, the the one girl zombie is kind of reminds me of like Night of the Living Dead, you know, just the hair. Oh yeah, out. and that's a pretty graphic scene. Yeah, the violence. Is, yeah, yeah, with the head chopped off. That was really yeah, that cool. one does have a decapitation. Well, what, I mean, the one point in the movie when uh, Michael Ripper decides to join them is they're actually digging the graves. The two doctors, so the, the the doctor in the town, and then one of the friend, the Andre Morel, Morel mm-hmm. who's been called in to help, they're digging up one of the bodies, and um, the cops catch him. And before he, he opens the grave real quick, and they're empty, and he's like oh, shit, something's going on. Instead of being, like, the cheap cop, like, you're going downtown, and we're going to cover this up. Right. Which is, like, so many of these Hammer superstitious movies, they actually decide to try to discover what the hell's going on. I think so many movies in general. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Cop doesn't want to write that report, so he's like, hey, you just go. Well, he he was in on it, too. Even though his character doesn't really get an outcome. Yeah, no, he disappears. Um, The husband has... The husband character. Yeah, the doctor he, husband. He's kind of obsolete after the beginning. I agree. Yeah. Um, because the the main doctor takes over, and he's so much a bigger force and better actor right. yeah. than him. And the bad guy over overshines him, too. Yeah, the fact, bad guy I don't even remember him. what happens to the husband. Like, it's like everything goes down in the mine, and like... It goes the, crazy. Yeah, the husband's... Go, and like, the husband, like, rushes in at the very last scene, and like... The doctor already did everything. He's like, what's going on? I was like, we gotta get out. It's like, okay, why are you even here, man? <laughs> like, kind of late to the party. 
this is cool though to see Hammer actually do a voodoo style zombie movie. I mean, this is right before Night of the Living Dead came out a couple years before, so there weren't the flesh eating corpses that we all love now. Right. And and the voodoo zombies are unique and very underutilized nowadays for sure. Mm. I mean, and and you can see a lot of the imagery, like how it inspired, I think, films in the seventies. Yeah, they, they look really good. They and do. It has the same sets we're used to. There's no complaints here about it. Oh yeah, it's. I mean the the. Graveyard we're digging up is the same graveyard you've seen 15 I feel, times over. I feel like it is a lot of the same sets and stuff, and I like seeing that. Yeah. Um, it does seem like one of the more bigger budget ones, bigger budget ones, probably. I wonder if the reptile is the cheap, cheapy of the two. My guess is probably reptile and Rasputin are probably going to be the cheaper. Uh, yeah, I... I I think Rasputin's probably shot with Dracula, Prince of Darkness as well. Back yeah. To back. So, yeah, like, I don't know if they're doing the cheapy, but it feels like that. Sometimes you get a big color one and then a black and white cheapy. But I don't know if they're going to do maybe all four of these are mid-range. I know this was a four-part deal to sweeten the deal, and Dracula, yeah. Prince of Darkness was like the cherry on top. Like, they said that they made Dracula and Rasputin together, and but then they the were and two. Flag. So they, they switched them up so people wouldn't catch on. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, they'd be like putting Dracula and Spanish Dracula back to back as the double feature. Like, this is shot on the same set. You right. ripped me off. That's the same movie. I think they said we didn't want two Christopher Lees being back to back. Isn't that what they said? Well, yeah, they might have sweetened the deal. Yeah, so they, exactly. But um, I think this one's solid. I'm writing like three out of five for it. Yeah, I guess I'll say three out of five. I almost want to give it a two and a half. But I almost want really to give it a two scenes. and a half, but you guilted me into giving it a three, and then you're going to switch to two and a half? Because I was like, man, you're like, I don't know, it's, it's really good looking. It's all part of my master plan. No, it, it, it does good. It looks good. The zombies are good. The nightmare scene, I think, gives it that extra half star. Yeah, yeah. Urban nightmare scene. Yeah, well, if you, if you like that nightmare scene, you should watch The Tombs of the Blind Dead. I don't want to watch that. No, I think you'd like it in Spanish. Oh, yeah, okay. The, the zombies are really cool. They're basically skeletons, and they, they're, they're um, geez, what are they? They're like Knights Templar, and they okay, don't have eyes, like that. and they're on horses, and they have swords. They don't really eat people. See, I would like that. And they hear you. They, like, hear, and they, like, so It's really cool. I don't know why, but when I was a kid, skeletons were the scariest thing to me, but now they're the funniest thing to me. Like, any time there's a serious movie and I see a skeleton, especially if it's, like, moving around... I can't stop laughing. Like, Skeletons are awesome. When when that that mummy trailer came out, uh, which one? The the new mummy with a. Uh, I've oh, never Tom seen Cruise. it. Yeah, but in the trailer, there's like three skeletons in the water. And we're like, and I'm like, I, I lost it. Like, I can never take this movie seriously because there's animated skeletons. Okay. Um, do you want to do this one? No, you, you usually do, do this one though. Yeah, but. Okay. This. this is uh, John Stanley's Creature Features. It was not on tear on tape. And Plague of the Zombies, um, 1966, three and a half out of five stars from uh, John Stanley. Uh, director John Gilling has fashioned a stylish gothic hammer horror thriller set in the last century that builds tension with superior production values. Peter Bryan's storyline touches on British hierarchy and its indifference to the working class when a doctor and his daughter come to visit an old friend in an eerie Cornish village and uncover a sadistic squire who turns men into voodoo zombies to work an old tin mine beneath his plantation. Especially memorable are scenes with in white corpses slither and wiggle out of their graves. One of Hammer's best. I don't think it's one of the best. I don't think it's so. No. But he spoiled it. I mean, like, it's funny. It's like we, we were originally trying to, like, avoid spoilers, but in the Hammer movies, so we're going to spoil it because we're going through the whole thing. And, and, and like, the they never, the Tin Mine, you don't even realize because, like, the Tin Mine is, like, a, it's kind of a reveal at the end when they go in the Tin Mine. Like, yeah, like, in the beginning, he says, like, watch your step out there. There's an old Tin Mine. And I thought the way the movie was going to go was, like that, we're going to fall into the tin mine, we're going to be trapped, there's going to be all the zombies. Well, no, they explain that he owned it, and yeah. they had to close it down because people were having horrible accidents, no one was scared to work there, so the dead can't be scared, they're dead! But, oh, like, this whole town was so repulsive within the first five minutes of the movie, like, they go there, there's assholes chasing a fox, the rapist group, um, in the red coats, and she lies to him and tells him the wrong way, so they crash into, like, the, their carriage and one of the coffins that's coming out or into town or something like that falls out and there's a dead body there and then the brother of the dead body uh, the dead person blames them and's a real asshole everybody in the town you're just like at the beginning I would just be like oh I'm gonna leave you guys on your own yeah you can all turn the zombies yeah. for all I care exactly but um cool movie decent it's alright um and it's unique because it is a uh, Hammer's only zombie movie I think is it really the only zombie I one? think so 
unless you want to count night creatures. Dracula is technically a zombie. He's not a zombie. How is he not a zombie? He is a vampire. He's a living dead. So is Frankenstein's monster. They're yeah, not so there's zombies. Other zombies. They're not zombies. They're zombie-ish. Wrong. But uh, there's uh, some special features on the Scream Factory disc, like an interview with a couple of the actors and experts. It's all cut up into a nice little featurette. And then there's also the uh, Oliver Reed narrated uh, mummies, yeah. zombies, and um, other monsters or something like that on there. So the yeah. world of Hammer. So that's cool. Uh, check it out. Uh, Rasputin the Mad Monk will be next week. I, I'm kind of excited to see that one. For some reason, I've actually seen a couple movies with Rasputin in them for some reason. Maybe we should save it for next week, but what's been your favorite Rasputin movie? Well, he's in Hellboy. He's in uh, Agony, he's and in uh, there's that one character that's like Rasputin. The Agony, the Rasputin movie. That one's just too long, Russian movie. Yeah. And then um, we have the character from Horror Express who's kind of like Rasputin. Yeah. And then we have Anastasia. Anastasia might be mine. Yeah. Well, we can't I, talk, I well let's talk about that next week. We're going to talk about Anastasia next week. We're talking week. about Rasputin. We going to talk about Anastasia. All right. This coach is bound for a terrifying destination. Dead. But no corpse can remain at peace in this village of the undead, this land of the zombies. In this place, no one is safe. No one can hide from witchcraft, superstition, and fear. No! Even Sir James Forbes, the clear-headed man of science, was forced to accept the horrifying facts. Young Martinus also says that he saw something on the moors, something that he insists was his brother. But we know that his brother is dead. We also know that he is not lying in his coffin. Someone in this village is practicing witchcraft. That corpse wandering on the moors is an undead a zombie. <laughs> A place dominated by men without morals, whose blood lusts are excited by hunting a human quarry. When Sylvia Forbes hated the young squire, it was dangerous. But when she fell in love with him, it was lethal. Okay, let's get into these questions. Uh, Nick Mua, is there any past Halloween that was particularly memorable or scary? I mean, I had a lot of ones. I mean, I used to be that guy who, went in like high school or a little after high school, where you're like, I got to dress up into the weirdest costume I could find. So I was Tom Selleck, of course. I was Jesus Christ twice uh, when he was alive and after crucifixion, which are probably really tasteless costumes once you think about it. But hey, I was even Hitler when I was in high school. These aren't funny. You know, but I was a, a douchebag. I was like 16, 17, thinking this is funny. Not funny, but hey, kids are stupid. But uh, some other memorable Halloweens. When I was a real little kid, I'm trying to think um, memorable. I mean, I was Creature from the Black Lagoon, the Crypt Keeper. I can't think of any super memorable. They were all memorable to me. That one moment where I told you where that guy grabbed my arm was probably the most. I, I think I mentioned that the other time. Are there any All Hallows' Eve traditions specific to Ohio? Any Round the Campfire stories set in Ohio? Uh, you know, I don't know any camp um, stories around Ohio necessarily. Um, personally, there was a haunted orphanage, which I've mentioned before. It's torn down. That was in a mommy. And um, there is no traditions that I know particularly in Ohio, except that we used to just pass out candy and go trick-or-treating. Which do you find more challenging as an actor, being scared or being funny? Um... 
I probably would say being scared because uh, when I'm being funny, I think it's just uh, I always play everything straight. I mean, I, I play it as straight as I can play it. Um, let the dialogue speak for itself and uh, your timing hopefully comes off naturally. It, being funny is either people are going to think you're funny or they're not, or you are funny or you're not. You know, that's for the audience to decide. But um, so I think it's um, probably e more challenging to be scared, although I don't feel that's too hard either. I think that more depth to a character, maybe being scared somebody who's a little bit more complex not just a one thing one note pony like you can be funny or you can be scared or you can be angry but it needs to have more depth to it a different type of it you have to it, it depends that's a little broad question to ask because i need to be a certain type of character would be hard for me to play like somebody who grew up in you know the hood that was like uh you know used a lot of uh, you know slang terms would be difficult for me to play because i don't I, I might know people like that but i don't know if i would be able to get comfortable enough to do it for a long period of time. So something like that would be more difficult than being scared or being funny for me. Old answers. We have some answers about everybody's favorite uh, monster and favorite uh, uh, icon. Uh, Nick Wachowski, Frankenstein's monster, and Sir Graves Ghastly. Uh, Rachel Weichler, Dracula, and I'm terrified of Michael Myers. Uh, Dustin Mills, favorite monster's hard. I really like the Rancor from Return of the Jedi, but my favorite horror monster is probably Pumpkinhead. Icon is hard too, actually. Either Jeffrey Combs or Vincent Price. Steve Radinsky, favorite monster. This is generally super hard, but I'm going to go with my gut and say the Xenomorph. Icon, assuming we need characters, Freddy Krueger. Seb Godin, Monster, the original Godzilla, Icon, Peter Cushing, or Boris Karloff. But if you mean characters, then the Frankenstein Monster. Dan Mead, Monster, toss it between Graboids from Tremors or Zombies and 28 Days Later. Icon, Vincent Price all the way. Now somebody's going to yell at him and say, They're not zombies in 28 Days Later, they're infected. We get it. Argument's over, let's just stop it. Okay, then new answers. We had some question of the week last week was um, name uh, a, a true crime that you'd like to see made into a movie and tell me a taste a movie that was a true crime story that was tasteless and one that was done right. It wasn't tasteless. Um, we have Peek and Boo. They should do a movie of true crime of Jeffrey Epstein, but we all know no one will. And I don't want to watch it. It's kind of funny, though. Like, we have this billionaire who's like a piece of crap that literally has connections to all these rich elites from every side of the political spectrum yet nobody does anything about it and then like after he's caught and dead somebody will go out and make money off of uh, make a movie and make money off of it but no one will ever go in depth about anything else on it it's just it's just sad in a lot of ways dead uh uh flintstone i think zodiac is tasteful true crime movie and kind of a masterpiece all the characters are well explored and the violence is confronting and realistic the scene in broad daylight by the lake is terrifying I agree that Matthew Bright's Bundy movie is lured and trashy. He made Bundy appear pathetic uh, pathetic by the end of the movie, but the punchline feels like, but hey, it was a wild ride. Nick Mua. Kind of putting my own country forward here, but I believe that the uh, Mark... Dutroc's case, kidnapper abuser, ought to make its way to the big screen or a decent miniseries, especially now that he's up for parole. Worst crime, uh, true crime film ad adaptation. Boy, so much garbage to sift through, but I would have to, uh, I would have to. Umay Lamol's The Night Stalker. Uh, Lommels. This 2009 shit tsunami doesn't get anything right, has horrid acted, is ridiculously grainy. No, just no. The Town That Dreaded Sundown has always been one of my favorite true crime inspired adaptations. Classy yet grueling, quite factual, and the subject is treated with respect. I, I really do enjoy the Town That Dreaded Sundown. Um, oh, Ulame uh, uh, Lamel. I know he has a bad track record for a lot of these new serial killer movies, but his movie, uh, Tenderness of the Wolves, which I believe was based on Fritz Harman, is a really good film. And it was his second or first directed first directed feature film. Arrow put it out. That's a really good movie. Um, Viper Rose, 1978. I would like to see a story on Richard uh, Robert uh, Picton. Um, Robert Willie Picton, yeah. the A Canadian pig farmer who was throwing prostitutes in a pen for pigs to eat up. Most ta uh, most tasteless was Carla. Well, let me say, yeah, I know quite a bit about, I don't know quite a bit, but I know about the Picton case. Really gross. One of the worst. Um, the most tasteless was Carla about Carla Homalka. It made the whole story look like she was a victim. In all the reality, she was responsible for killing her own sister, then turned on her husband, Paul Bernardo, Bernardo, and got off easy. Read up on it because it's a crazy story. I always thought Helter Skelter was well done. Yeah, I know the story of uh, um, Paul, and they call him what, the Ken and Barbie murderers? Yeah, really disgusting story, and they got a plea deal with her, so she pretty much walked. Sometimes you just wish people would kill, like find people like that and kill them. Uh, you know, like... I shouldn't say that kind of stuff. I can get in trouble for that. Like, Casey Anthony. <laughs> oh. 
David Lawrence. I think most of them come off tasteless um, since they seem to reveal re revel in depicting a recreation of the crimes. The Boston Strangler received heavy uh, planets. On, oh, yeah, sorry. But there's one particular scene with Curtis that is more gratuitous than it needs to be. Zodiac is probably the peak for me due to the creative talent of everyone involved, but also because the focus is journalism rather than the murders. But they're in there. All the president's men for a different kind of crime. Sometimes reading a lot, I mix up my words. The Dingus. This will make a good movie someday. He uh, he posts this story right here um, about uh, this allegedly built in illegal vaping business accused doc um, and he like was a drug dealer with his brother and I don't know much about the case but uh, yeah they had illegal vaping business sold drugs yada 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 then we have uh, Derek Donna King um, she says her husband's case would be well but I don't know the actual uh, case of it so can't get into details about that jimmy cribs is taste as for tasteless bully is pretty tasteless it's not necessarily bad but maybe trashy is the word i'm looking for dustin mills david parker ray scares me the most ha hard to do tastely but would really scare really scary and fascinating and he hates that shit ass netflix bundy movie he thinks it was tasteless crap zodiac and citizen x are the best i can think of the new orleans axeman would be a cool movie okay jp uh Adrica? trashy the baseline killer and not accurate at all any Ulai Lamel serial killer movie is guaranteed exploitative and inaccurate trash. Well done, Blue Caprice, about the uh, Beltway snipers. Not exploitative to the victims. Focus more on the dynamics of the killers. See No Evil, The Moore's Murders. Very tasteful saga of terrible child murders. Appropriate adult. Tasteful doc of drama about Fred and Rosemary West, two heartless monsters. Oh, I didn't ever heard of that one with the... Um, a Fred and Rosemary West. Snowtown walks the line between being accurate and exploitative. John Bunning becomes a father figure to a 15-year-old, gets him into becoming an accomplice to murdering the mentally disabled, accused pedophiles, basically anyone on his list. I've seen that movie. I, I thought it was a good movie. Out of the Blue, about the um, Aramonona shooting massacre. I'm sorry, I never, I don't know that. Reading told, uh, really told about the heroism that day in tragedy. I think I saw Out of the Blue, actually. Yeah, is that the um, one in Australia or New Zealand? Um, I think it's New Zealand. Um, Monster, well done and gritty. Dear Mr. Gacy, well done, not tasteless. Cody Lee Harden, the Victor Salva story. Stop it. Um, Brian Papandrea, give sweet Cody Lee Harden his clown hustler already. It's not his. He didn't purchase it. Uh, J.P. Andrika, possible cases for movies. Uh, the Doodler, he sketched men he slept with before killing them. That is an interesting case. The Zebra Murders, the Australian schoolgirl murders. It was made into an American Girls 2013 and seemingly never released. Not sure they could make a film of the Children of Snow, Detroit Child Murders. There was a true crime series. Same goes for the Long Island Child Murders. Probably too controversial. Jesse Wright, um, this is a little off topic, but since you brought up The Doodler, what did you think of Film Cruising with Al Pacino? I think it's very underrated. He started talking about cruising, and I think that is interesting to compare those two, the case of the uh, the doodler and um, cruising, because I do think there is similarities. And then uh, they, they talk about the um, the hospital worker, Paul Bateson, who is a serial killer and everything like that, and he worked on The Exorcist and never got formally charged for these murders. That's an interesting case, too. It's weird that it ties in with The Exorcist and cruising in a way. Uh, Peter England, true crime story you want to make into a movie, is it actually just? It was actually just made after all these years. Martin Scorsese's film, The Irishman. Um, then we have film based on true crime. You found tasteless. Ted Bundy, my Matthew Bright. Film based on true crime. You felt handled it well. See, I think um, I was talking about the Bundy Netflix movie. I don't think I. I didn't like that other Bundy movie either. Matthew Bright did that one. The guy who did Freeway did that Bundy movie. That's a shame. I didn't know he did that one. I didn't like that Bundy movie at all. Um, either Bundy movie actually. Uh, top. I didn't see Deliberate Stranger though. So and then Peter England has top five that he felt handled it well. The Boston Strangler, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, Goodfellas, Citizen X, Zodiac, Sadie Tate. Um, would be cool. The Tammy Lynn Leper case, tasteless. The Haunting of Sharon Tate. Well done, Henry. There are probably more, but that's the first that comes to mind. Jason Lindbergh. Thank you. Glad someone else agrees. I came close to shutting it off. They're both. Ta they're talking about the Haunting of Sharon Tate. Sa Sadie Tate. Re zero redeeming qualities. Jason Lindbergh. The what if ending was kind of neat, but overall I agree. The acting was off on almost all counts, especially the guy who played Tex. While watching it, I did wonder if you and Brian saw it. Now I have my answer. Okay, and then Jason Limber goes on to pick his. H.H. H. Holmes um, is the movie he'd like to see, uh, the true crime story he'd like to see a movie made. The Haunting of Sharon Tate was a little taste, which was the betrayal of Sharon. Then kind of made up for it, but it was definitely pissed me off watching. And the uh, Laramie Project. Cody Rapp, I think uh, something about H.H. H. Holmes or Albert Fish would be interesting as a kind of dark character studies. 
no joke, one of the absolute most abhorrent, uh, abhorrent, sorry, disgusting and awful pieces of cinema I've ever seen is Del Playa, a really cheap and tasteless slasher film inspired by the shooting spree committed by Elliot Roger in 2014. Ugh, they made that? Side note, Roger, for those who are unaware, committed, okay, he goes into the history of Elliot um, Roger, who we know is a piece of shit uh, mass shooter. Um, and then he talks about the film a little bit. The film, the play, attempts to make Elliot look like a sad, broken, tortured soul pushed to um, this due to abuse and bullying, but not. But no, he was just a sociopath from the beginning and ranting on YouTube has started an internet counterculture called incels, um, which is just a bunch of racist white guys who blame women and non-whites for problems getting laid. Since that shooting in 2014, there have been more shootings committed by guys who call themselves incels. As for a true crime film, I think it handled it well. I honestly think it's nearly impossible to make true crime Especially one having to do with serial killers and mass murder that doesn't go off tasteless in some way. That being said, here, here's ones he's picking. That being said, the few I would say you are are at least interesting are the Manson family, Henry Porter's serial killer, and the Dirties, which which the latter doesn't even really count because it's just a dark comedy about mass shooting and not really directly based on anything, but it has a lot of parallels that can be found in real life, so I figured to include it. Okay. Um, JP and Nirka, they made a TV movie, The Gray Man, about Albert Fish. It was intense, not overly graphic, but still got the message across. There's a docudrama called Albert Fish in the Sin He Found Salvation. He's also talking a little bit about, they're kind of bouncing back and forth about the Elliot Roger case, so I'm going to skip some of that. Um, You're like a Dolphing, H.H. Holmes Hotel they should make. Ed Gein with Hotter was bad, and Henry is classic. Corey Walter, true crime case that I want to see done well would be a good Night Stalker, Richard Mira's movie. All the ones about him are poo-poo. And one that felt exploitive would def be Uli Mel movies on the Night Stalker and Bundy. And best ones are the, the Deliberate Stranger miniseries and To Catch a Killer with Brian Dennehy as Gacy. Um, and then, uh, okay, here we go. JP uh, Dricka comments again, I didn't mind the one starring Lou Diamond Phillips as the Night Stalker was made for TV. It wasn't exploitative. Okay. Ooh, I missed uh, Anthony Padella's comment. I'm sorry, Anthony Padella. Um, if, if you are listening, re, re-hit it because something happened where it's not showing the whole comment. Then we have Marta. Oh, wait, here it is. Never mind, we have it. Anthony Padella, true crime that make a good movie. Madahara, I don't think that a spy case has ever been fully investigated. So many unanswered questions. True crime movie that came off tasteless. The Versace murders. A murder. Uh, the true crime movie that got it right. The John Wayne Gacy movie with Brian Denny. He was captivating in that role. Okay. Then we have Stephen McGurvin. One that came off tasteless was The Resurrection Man. Absolute crap. And he posted a trailer. That looked rough. Uh, Andre Scott. One that did it right to me is Zodiac. Both the theatrical cut and the extended director's cut. Shazine Barbarian. I haven't seen an H.H. Holmes movie, which is weird seeing how he is one of the most fascinating men in history. Trashy Any Serial Killer by Ulay Lamel. And there are a ton of well-made serial killer flicks, but I think my personal favorite would be Henry Porch of a Serial Killer. Peter McCain. I, uh... No, there's been inspired films, but the Hello Kitty murder could do a decent quality movie. Good true crime film? Hmm, I remember. Let me. It's been quite a while. Um, here he goes. He names Memories of Murder is also really good. I remember Let Him Have It being quite good. I don't know that movie. That's why it kind of threw me off when I was reading it. Thomas, some of the times, like, the grammar or things are just mixed up, so it takes me a second to read. I should probably redo these better. But Thomas um, Filio. Charlie Starkweather. I know there have been uh, made a few movies, but they seem small and not enough people have seen them. I know that um, Badlands is based on Charlie Starkweather to a certain extent. Star 80. The death of Dory, Dorothy Stratton. It seemed like not long ago after her death, they were glamorizing it with a couple of movies. BDG Reviews. Like to see uh, something about... Um, this This guy I don't know. Uh, Tusutomo uh, Miyazaki. I don't know if he is um, one of the Asian serial killers. I know there's a couple of really prolific ones. Um, one who was a cannibal, but I don't know his name. Tasteless Ed Gein, hotter version, and got it right, Henry. Matthew Hudson, maybe it's too soon, but as soon as it's wrapped up, I'd like to see a movie about the, uh, uh, I guess, E A R O, what is it, the Golden State Rapist? I think that's who he's looking for. So maybe it would be best as a theatrical documentary, though, not like something you see on the History Channel, but something more artistic and theatrically structured. In bad taste, I'd say Paradise Lost 2. My reason being that it starts off being mostly about how awesome their first movie is, then it contradicts some important facts in the first one. I did really enjoy Part 1, but Part 2 didn't sit well with me. You know, I kind of agree to a certain extent. It was very captivating, but when they follow the father like burning things at the crick, you're like, what is this? This is kind of exploitative of him. 
got it right, I'd have to say the thin blue line. It perfectly sets up two main characters and shows how infallible eyewitness testimony can be. It doesn't only make you doubt the convicted man's guilt, but ends with what is about as close to a confession as you can get. One of my top ten uh, movies of all time. That is a tremendous film, The Thin Blue Line, if anybody hasn't seen that. Derek Austin, the stories of Angel Martino Reden, um, Resendez or Anthony Sowell would make good movies, in my opinion. Tasteless True Crime, uh, Marian Dora's Cannibal is pretty raunchy. And as for what got it right, there's a few, but I'll go with Zach Efron's movie, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, where he plays Ten Buddy. Oh, man, I really don't think that. I, that's the one that I think got, didn't got it horribly wrong, but that's me. Or Deranged with Ed Gein-inspired film. Now, that one I think is probably a little bit more accurate. James Higgins. I think the real story of The Corpse Bride is so interesting and disturbing. I just listened to it in a podcast called My Favorite Murder. Uh, Zach Nolan. A good Richard Ramirez film would be terrifying. He was a demon on Earth. Best true crime films are Confessions of a Serial Killer and Deranged. I don't know about Tasteless, but The Night Soccer 2002 sucked. I haven't heard anybody mention Confessions of a Serial Killer in a long time. That one's pretty, I think, more accurate than Henry, but not as good a film. Um, really disturbing, actually, especially for a TV movie, I think it was. And then we have Derek Donna King. I think the original Helter Skelter was a good film. The Haunting of Sharon Tate was tasteless and contrived. I'd like to see a film about the handsome murders or Derek and Alex King case. Okay, there we go. And you know what? I want to ask kind of a funny question, I guess. Question of the week is, what? It, remember back in high school or like elementary school where they made you watch a movie, educational or not, and it kind of pertained to the subject, or maybe it was just a bonus day or something where they made you, what is the best movie you were forced to watch in high school or school in general? What is the Not college though, because you always get good movies in college. Um, but what is the best movie you were forced to watch in high school or under? And I guess we're going to hop into the very short update. Okay, we have a real quick update. Killer Crocodile from Severn Films. This is part one, and part two is the collector's edition. I love these movies. They're really fun Italian horror films. I guess Jaws ripoffs, but I'll probably be reviewing these next week. So, uh, yeah, definitely going to check these out. You know what's funny is I didn't even mention that um, I'll be at Cinema Wasteland when you see this video, so come up and say hi, guys. Um, I'm going uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, first weekend of October. I'm just plugging this in now. But we have Zambarella's House of Whores. Um, this is going to be in next week's video as well, but I couldn't get to it. Yeah, this is a SOV movie. This is uh, Tony Tony's new company. What? How do they say his last name? Uh, Tony Masanello. He actually directed this one. So yeah, it's a horror anthology. Look forward to checking it out. His first release, what was it, Metal Noir, is out. And they uh, continue with more of them. So pretty cool. Yeah, so come say what's up at Cinema Wasteland. I'll be there uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, you guys have a good one. Mm.